you know, so we were looking everywhere, and uh, the director is, uh, <laughs> he has a, a half-brother, half-sister who lives in Germany, are Germans, and they went to visit at Christmas uh, time, <coughs> sometimes in 2011. Um, and they went on a Christmas dinner, and you, you know, went out for a few drinks, and two o'clock at night in a bar, a Danish, very, very educated guy was standing very drunk, uh, and heard overheard that they were talking German, and suddenly he turns around this guy and says, "Are you are you Germans?" And they said, "Yes." And he said, "Heil Hitler." And the director just he calls me up ten minutes later, way down the street, and called me up, wake me up at night, and say, "I just realized that this is something that when people get drunk, <laughs> you know, a very kid, your man, forty-eight or forty-five or so." haven't, you know, been through a war or anything, uh, you know, get this on top of his mind when he's drunk. What is that about? And suddenly we started to research the, uh, a little bit about the, the cultural, historical dilemmas there is between Denmark and Germany. And the first thing that popped up to us was uh, how, uh, how um, the, the, the Danes reacted to the, the, the Brits, uh, you know, getting rid of Hitler's army because we were occupied for five years in Denmark. And you know, how the hate somehow still is built inside of us uh, towards our former enemy 70 years ago. And we found that very interesting. And, and some of the first things that came up was actually how we treated uh, POWs after, uh, after war. Uh, and in this case, uh, we heard a little story about uh, somebody was clearing landmines and think landmines and the next thing we knew was there was a you know some factual you know things that says there were around two million landmines on the west coast and i didn't know that i didn't knew that so there was just two million landmines on that fairly small area <laughs> that's a lot of mines and did you have to do the research yourself i mean had this been written or did you have to go out and and, and find out what had actually happened here. That was actually the most um, out of my mind blowing experience that there was so little written about this. And we looked and we researched for a year, two years, and we couldn't find, well, it was very limited with, with stories from that time about the particularly, you know, treat of, you know, German POWs clearing landmines and how we treated each other after the war and, you know, and it's, you know, and, and we wanted to do a human story and, you know, the conflict and dilemma of this, you know, a landmine that is basically the, uh, made by the devil. I don't know, it's, and, and, and suddenly a new world revealed to us how landmines is still working in the world today and it's still, and it was back then. And I don't know if you can imagine two million landmines. I mean, you probably know much more landmines about landmines than I do, but two million landmines, that's a lot of mines. But we'll uh, get to that in a minute, yeah. I'm sure that there's, I don't know how many out there are now, but um, <laughs> we'll hear that. But just, just quickly, before we, we move on to, to today, um, were you able to speak to some of the people in the film? I mean, were any of them still alive that, that those characters were based on? After a nine month of research, we went into the archives, you know, tried to call, contact uh, um, veterans, clubs in Denmark, etc. And it was very limited with people who were still alive, that were I, the Danes who were, who were actually on the beaches at the time. But we found one who was 90, 91, I think. He's, he died last year, unfortunately. But um, we looked him up and he was very, very difficult to convince about speaking to us. We wanted to interview him, but occasionally he eventually he, he, he agreed. And after ten minutes, he started crying for three hours about how they treated, you know. And the bigger story of that was revealed to us because we we got to know that they were, you know, teenagers. You know, two thirds of them were young boys because I mean Hitler put everybody, all the men, to war, so they were almost killed everybody. So suddenly this story opens about, you know, you know, how can you hate a 14-year-old boy for somebody, for something that, you know, a crazy man did? Um, and that opens up the, the, the wider story, the human story about revenge, forgiveness, and once you basically meet another human being, even though that he's supposed to be your enemy, you find out that he's 
you know, just flesh and blood and lack of love and fool as you are. James, I am going to come to you, but I just want to ask one more thing about this, the film specifically, sorry, which is um, when this screened back home with you, what was the reaction? I mean, this was a history that presumably people weren't that proud of. What, what, how did that well, the, debate one, play the one thing that we really, really wanted is that we didn't want to point fingers directly at Danes or Germans. We wanted to be an objective story about the dilemmas of this. And of course, as you can see in the beginning, I mean, this guy, he's allowed to hate his enemy because they have terrorized him for five years and his backstory, the side of his backstory in the movie is that his father, as many fathers, were imprisoned or, you know, terrorized by the Germans uh, if they didn't, you know, did what they, they, they asked him to do. Um, so that was his background story as a character. Uh, so he was allowed to hate them, but once he meets these, you know, the little, this little group of soldiers that he gets, he finds out that it's, you know, it's just human beings, and besides that, they're only boys. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, there is a lot of terrifying stories around that particular situation and, and subject in the movie that we didn't put in the movie because otherwise we would have pointed fingers. There is one special thing that the last three months of the clear, uh, landmine clearings, at least the official recorded landmine clearings, because there are also facts that says that it went on for a longer period of time. But uh, that was that, 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 that the last three months, because the, the, the Brits and the Danes wanted to pace up the clearings. Um, so, so, uh, so you know, there, was, there were a lot of things going on. And, you know, um, the Danes, the local Danes, they, they saw it as, a, as, a, as an entertainment circus. So every day around 4.30, when the group of Germans on a particular area of the beach, they were they have cleared a, a minefield. Uh, you know the Danes went with picnics to the Duns and just watched them because they were forced to actually do the death march, as they called it, to take each other by the hand and walk through the mines to, to you know to 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 prove that they have cleared it properly. And that actually happened. I have actually had a photo, have a, photo, a real photo from that time where well the death march is going on, and they asked to. The, the history with that photo is that they had to walk it twice because on the first photo they didn't smile. So they were forced to smile so, so it could be a public picture. James, um, how's, it, how's the technology moved on now in terms of how do you remove mines? I mean, this, this was obviously very, very basic, you know, through sand, jabbing. <coughs> how do things work today? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth just casting your minds back to what what this is all about. Essentially, the road to Berlin is a lot shorter from Denmark than it would have been from the Normandy beaches. And the Germans assumed that uh, the Allies might seek to land there, and that is why it was so heavily mined. And of course, military mine clearance is essentially about forcing quite a narrow gap in order to allow you to escape uh, the beachhead and move inland. Something has to happen, though, after a war, which is there can't just be a, a narrow lane punch through the minefield, there has to be the wholesale clearance of it. Because nobody really put any thought to how this might be done. And after a war which involved uh, genocide, slave labor, uh, the really the most brutal war in history, in some ways this seemed just another aspect of man's uh, inhumanity to man. But once war is over, you need to find a different way of doing this. So uh, a soldier who fought in that very same war and experienced landmines in Italy founded the Halo Trust in 1988, and Halo is very much a product of uh, the end of the Cold War. We, we in, a, in a sense, came into being to clear up the Cold War, and landmines were used extremely extensively throughout the Cold War in all the various proxy conflicts that we're all familiar with. And the technology has moved on from the Second World War, where you're seeing basically metal and wooden boxes, uh, and really from the 1960s onwards, we're seeing the wholesale use of plastics. Plastics have two really quite lethal consequences. First, uh, they don't corrode. So a mine put in the ground in 1960 will still be lethal in 2018. And secondly, they're very hard to detect because you can't use a metal detector um, because the, the amount of metal parts in it are very low. So the technology applied to this has moved on a great deal. Another aspect, of course, has been that the great weight of effort to get rid of landmines was a state activity. The Ottawa Landmine Ban Treaty involved <coughs> states signing it. The problem we have now is, of course, that 
is non-state actors who are using these things and they're producing improvised explosive devices which are really homemade landmines. So a great deal of technology was applied to this problem during the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts and in t on top of uh, metal detection we now have ground penetration radar and we're able to overlay those two technologies with onboard computers uh, with the mine detectors and we have a much greater capacity to find landmines. There's a simplicity to finding a landmine on a beach because it's sand and a mine. The problem we have in many of the areas we operate in is it's much more complex terrain. It's on the hillside in Afghanistan, it's in a jungle in Cambodia, uh, it's in some really complex places where wars have been fought over that land and there's lots of contamination, other bits of military ordnance, uh, roots, bricks, stone, you name it, it's there. How do you tell the difference between a landmine and simply something that's a root? So this technology has all been developed to explore this, it's getting more and more sophisticated. Um, but of course now war isn't just fought in the countryside, it's fought in cities. And the great problem that we face today is, as a result of the conflict ongoing in Syria and Iraq is it's not being fought in the countryside. We're dealing with the biblical scales of destruction in cities like Aleppo, Mosul, uh, and Fallujah, and we're bringing to bear uh, new technologies, largely in the form of mechanical means, to clear the devices in those cities. So this is moving on, and we simply could not, for all the various obvious reasons you'll understand, accept the sorts of casualties um, that uh, were, were acceptable um, for the Danish clearance operation back in 1945. We still do suffer casualties, I'm sorry to say. It's only three weeks ago that we lost three people to a mine accident in Nagorno-Karabakh. And of course, we now operate inside of conflicts, not just after them. So many of the threats we face are from uh, terrorists, Taliban, ISIS, etc. The very live problem. We employ 8,000 people around the world, and they really do face um, perils every day of their working lives. Um, did this happen again post war? Have we seen situations where combatants have been forced to do this since the Second World War? Is that something that's happened? Uh, well, it's yeah. against the Geneva Convention. Sure. Uh, to to, to use people in this way. Yeah. Um, in the end of the Second World War, you know, who else was going to do it? And this is a real moral dilemma. The technology simply didn't exist to do it by any other means. And if it was not going to be Germans doing it, it would have been Danes. So this is why they did what they did. But um, they, they change, they change the, the, <coughs> the, the status of the, these POWs and they call them voluntary surrendered, uh, hostile voluntary surrendered personnel to get around, to get around the Geneva Convention. Well, I think that's, uh, <laughs> yes, well, I think we can all tell what that means. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, so uh, I have a number of experts in the audience. I'm going to turn to Simon Conway. Can you think of any examples where, in breach of international law, uh, a particular nation state has used prisoners to clear landmines in recent times? No, I think one of the one of the probably the, the most interesting case would be Cambodia in the late seventies. So when the Vietnamese pushed Pol Pot out, the people that they released from the camps held by Pol Pot were then made to lay mines on on the Thai border. So the K five mine belt, which is one of the densest mine belts in the world, which we're busily chipping away at, um, that was laid by effectively slave labour. It wasn't it wasn't cleared by slave labour. So I'm not. I'm not no, I don't think there are any large-scale cases. Though. I mean, I'd like to turn a vice into a virtue. We, we are a voluntary organisation. We employ 8,000 deminers around the world. And I, you know, I celebrate the fact that we employ ex-combatants because we want to give them a peaceful livelihood that isn't conflict. You know, lay down your AK-47, take up uh, your mine detector. And for me, that is a, a positive <laughs> thing. And have you seen that help cure... Yeah, absolutely. And we, we very much see our role as threefold. Give, give a short-term job as a deminer, create a long-term job because you're clearing land and creating a livelihood, normally an agricultural livelihood, and third, play a part in peace and reconciliation. So we have a much bigger role to play than simply the mechanics of mine clearance. Can you just give people a sense of, um, you're clearing mines obviously all the time, mines are still being laid yeah. today. Um, net, is, is it the actual number of mines out there falling or growing? What's actually happening? Well, we're, you know, we're all people interested in current affairs and we know that we live on the Korean Peninsula with, with the issue of uh, nuclear arms control. We all know that 
in Syria recently we've dealt with the issue of chemical arms control. And the great news story about landmines is they are actually, it is possible to put these things into the history books. People are actually not laying conventional landmines uh, with a couple of minor exceptions, well, important exceptions. Um, most nations have signed the Oxford Landmine Ban Treaty and we are chipping away at this problem. We've recently cleared the whole of Mozambique. It is now a completely mine-free country. And we're confident that places like, with the right amounts of money, places like Angola, Zimbabwe, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, can be brought to mine-free states. Our problem is our donors, who are still supporting mine clearance quite generously, have begun to refocus on the Middle East. And perhaps that's understandable, but it has left a gap we need to find new donors to enable us to clear those countries. We can make these countries mine free and we have uh, every intention of doing so and our target is 2025 um, for those countries to be clear. Will there be countries that we can't reach? Of course there will be. North Korea, unless the guy like Mr. Trump pulls off something, um, is not going to be reachable, nor is Iran. There will be countries out there that will be difficult to clear. But on the whole, this is a great new story for the world and these weapon systems can be put into the history books. Okay. Um, you said people still die. I mean, can you give a sense of how risky it is nowadays yeah. to do this? So I think, let's, let's take the risk in two parts. Just the, the mathematical inevitability of it. If you clear enough landmines, something's going to happen to you, is really the story of this film. That's the awfulness of it. But I think I'd like to just paint another picture, which is that if you are shot by a bullet, uh, yes, it can introduce infection because a piece of clothing or body armor can be taken through with the, the high velocity run. A landmine or an IED is a filthy, dirty weapon. It comes up from the ground, it explodes into your feet and to your legs, and it drives dirt uh, and um, the, the debris into your body and into the wounds. It creates really, really difficult injuries. So the risk associated with these kinds of casualties is really quite immense. And the, uh, the improvised explosive devices, the modern day landmine, homemade landmine in effect, is even worse because explosive types are, are mixed, uh, they're not, not of a factory standard, uh, and there is you know, some really very unpleasant injuries resulting from these things. We uh, have a set of industry standards that we follow extremely closely. Mine accidents uh, are always avoidable, but sometimes they happen because the drills must be followed and the supervision must be uh, as immaculate as we can make it. And we take great, great interest in this and we follow trends and we try to maintain the best possible standards. We're always experimenting. You know, we've looked at the use of dogs. The trouble with dogs is that they find most of the mines but not enough of them. They're quite a useful survey tool. We've even looked at rats. There's a the giant Madagascan pouch rat has been used. Um, it's quite an attractive gimmick, to be honest, but in reality, it's simply neither a dog nor a rat can get close enough to the ground. If you're in jungle, you've got to strim the ground, and to my knowledge, no rat has yet been taught to use a strimmer. So uh, there are problems with the use of animals. Ultimately, a human being is a more methodical and efficient uh, deminer, and you're creating a livelihood. But of course, mechanical means have a huge role to play in this, but in some parts of the world, because of the nature of the ground in very hilly mountainous regions or in jungle, it's simply not possible to get a mechanical asset in there, but we will do wherever we can. So in a jungle, you still have to go in manually at the end? Yes. And, yes. and what's the equivalent now of I mean, the death march. Well, how do you fully check that this we is... We don't do a death march. No, obviously. <laughs> but, but what's the... How do you fully check that this is... So we have a lot of quality assurance. Um, and essentially the landmine ban treaty has created a worldwide um, structure for how this is done. And essentially each nation that is a signatory to the treaty has a national authority. Uh, the national authority uh, works to the international mine action standards and there is a quality assurance aspect to what we do and we are of course uh, we're a charity, we're a non-governmental organisation we're funded by uh, nations like the United States is the biggest donor to mine action the United Kingdom is now the second biggest we 
and to persuade the UK to up its contribution very significantly. But our donors require certain standards of us, and they also have their own inspection capability. So there is a there is a lot of checks and balances in this system. Can you give a sense of um, what you think the film's done in terms of raising awareness and the impact it's had um, on this huge issue? You've, you've shown this around the world, you've won prizes around the world, you've had reactions in different places, obviously. Has it, do you think, had a big impact in you know, what people have actually been willing to do to solve this problem, donations, other things? Well, in my business, it is the greatest and biggest honor you can get is to be Academy nominated, obviously, uh, in my business, with it followed by a huge prestige. But my personally biggest experience with a fiction movie, it's not a documentary, but it's based on, on facts uh, and figures um, to a certain extent. Uh, my personally biggest experience was, you know, in Japan and China within three months. We went to the, the Tokyo International Film Festival where, where we won for best films. Uh, and. and um, we had a press conference uh, prior to the screening, and there were, you know, a, f a room full of journalists, and then I had we had a translator and a, a moderator, and you know, after 10, 12 minutes, suddenly, you know, the journalists started to, you know, discussing things we couldn't understand a word of it, and the translator couldn't really follow it. So, you know, after just in the in the audience. In the fact, oh, in the well, it was a right. press room. We right, were yeah. sitting here, and there's a lot of, you know proper press room. There was a lot of you know journalists there, and we didn't understand a clue of it. And after 12, 15 minutes, you know, the moderator had to stop them because it was pretty loud. They were discussing, and Japanese is very expressful. So you do are they mad? Are they? You, you don't really know. Um, and then the translator tried to you know briefly interpret <laughs> what was going on, and they were discussing. Uh, that this movie actually made them, you know, aware of that they should <coughs> maybe forget a little bit about history and look ahead instead of back all the time towards the hate and the conflict that they had with China throughout history. Uh, and that made me then make me have a goosebump. And they wrote about it in the newspapers, and it was a big thing. Also doing the Q and A afterwards with the audience. Uh, three and a half months later in Beijing, in the Beijing Film Festival, the exact same ha happens with Chinese journalists. And that, that's probably the biggest thing you can, you know, that it's not a documentary, it's a fiction film, but the impact of the subject matter and the human story, together with the post-war story about landmines and, you know, hate and mm -hmm. forgiveness and all that, 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 that was probably the biggest moment in my career with a movie like this. I came across the landmines with Oxfam in Angola and Mozambique, I came across landmines as a tourist in Laos at the Landmine Museum there. And just a couple of questions, a couple of points. In Angola during the war, women went up the hill into the fields because they had to. They knew that the fields were full of mines. In Laos, young kids went into the fields because metal had a market value and they, they looked for metal to, to so there's another angle to this that, you know, it's for yeah. poor people sometimes you don't have many choices. So mine action as, a, as an activity has five pillars, one of which is mine risk education. Sure. The fact of the matter is that the people most likely to become a casualty are boys aged between about 10 and 12 because culturally it tends to be boys who go out to play, boys like the look of a shiny object, they pick it up to, because it looks like a toy and the consequences result. So mine risk education is a really important part of mine action. Uh, we are doing it on a very big scale in Syria right now. Sometimes we can't reach the audience directly, but modern technology allows us to do it remotely. Um, but if you can reach uh, the, the vulnerable audience, you can, pr through education, you can prevent them from becoming casualties. So you're absolutely right. And how many casualties are there civilian casualties a year? Do we have a sense of how big that problem is? Well, the, the, so the numbers of casualties from landmines, as in traditional landmines, is, has reduced largely as a result of the success of our campaign to clear them. The numbers of casualties from IEDs is rising and rising pretty rapidly. Because of the conflict zones. Yes. Question for James. Um, 
Mine Action has been around for almost 30 years. Um, last December was the anniversary, 20th anniversary of the Ottawa Treaty, plus the Nobel Peace Prize being given to the International Cam Campaign to Ban Lamont. And yet those anniversaries pass with almost no attention in the media whatsoever. Can you explain that? Yeah. I think the people, you know, I, I, I don't just like to salute the people involved in this campaign. I mean, I'm relatively new to it. And there's some amazing people who've pretty much given their entire professional lives to this. And it's gone on quietly, painstakingly. Some people, somebody jokingly described it to me as a mix between gardening and, and archaeology, a lethal mixture of those two things. And they do it in a very understated way. And they're not really the sorts of people who seek the limelight and the glory. But it really is a remarkable achievement. You know? And I do think that if we could consign this particular class of weapons to the history books, it would be a truly amazing thing. It's within reach, within our generation. So I really would encourage you all, if you know people um, who could make this a difference, who, who could influence policymakers, you know, get them to rally behind this, because you're right, it doesn't get the attention, because somehow people only want to look at the, the thing that's happening today, whether it be Mr. Trump in Korea or bombing a chemical strike in Syria, and then the attention moves on in the media. I think to do this would be genuinely remarkable. Doing stories like this could be popular because it's a, it's, it could be, you know, looked at as a commercial project because it's fiction, which, you know, so, you know, it's, it's not our job as filmmakers to make a, you know, to make the big story wider in the, in, amongst the media and all that. I, hopefully a movie like this could bring some more attention to it because of the popularity of it. I mean, you know, you know it's, I know it's a cheap trick, but whatever works. Yep. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Are there any other questions? There's one here in the middle. <coughs> well, Marcus, congratulate you for an excellent film. Uh, it gives me hope because I can see Germany and Denmark, and I, I've traveled in Africa, and, I, uh, and sometimes you just like, you don't, you don't know if you're going to make it home, or these countries will ever make it home. Um, my question is for James. Um, do you, what other barriers do you have apart from financial barriers that you, you come up, uh, the head of trust come and face? Yeah, I mean, my biggest worry is, is my duty of care to my people. You know, in September, three of my uh, community outreach team, I remember reaching communities, talking to people, finding out where the landmines are is absolutely vital. If you can't know where they are, you're not going to clear in the right area. So a community outreach team of mine in Somalia, three young Somali women were taken hostage. And for two months, we had to deal with Al-Shabaab and eventually negotiate their release um, safely, thank goodness. Um, I mentioned the three people I lost to a landmine only three weeks ago in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, two and a half weeks ago, three of my people were taken hostage by the Taliban uh, after the Taliban attacked a, a police station. The police called in air support. The Taliban withdrew and on the way out they took hostages as a human shield to protect them against uh, a NATO airstrike. Again, we were able to negotiate their release. One of the people was shot dead uh, in Afghanistan uh, only last month. Um, one of our subcontractors working for Halo in Syria was shot dead, murdered in Syria. You know, it is often not the landmines that are killing. It is the other uh, operational risks that we take by working in conflict zones. That's the thing that worries me the most.